Miracy. I had to learn everything the hard way, which means screwing up and and mostly screwing up in public. But yeah, I learned and it was great, you know. And so I thought, gosh, like why should other writers have to go through this hard process? Why why not go through a class? Why can't I just make it easy for them? Hello and welcome to Course Lab, the show that teaches course creators like you how to make better online courses. I'm Danny Emi, the founder of Miracy, an education company, and I'm here with my co-host Abe Crystal, the co-founder of Rizuku. In each episode, we're going to showcase a course and course creator who is doing something really interesting with their course. Our guest today is Susan O'Connor. Susan, welcome to Course Lab. Thanks, Danny. I'm thrilled to be here. Hi, Abe. Hello, hello. So let's start at the beginning. Um, Susan, for people who are not familiar with you and your work, who are you? What do you do? How did you come to the world of online courses? And what is your course about? Who does it serve? Give us the give us the whole picture. I am a writer and a teacher, and I have a very unusual specialty. I actually for years and years now, I have been writing scripts and storylines for video games, which is a lot like uh, writing scripts and stories for movies. But instead of for movies, it's for games. Are there some games you've worked on that we might have heard of? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I've worked on uh, many, many games. Some of the titles I've worked on include Bioshock. I worked on that franchise. I worked on um, Star Wars franchise. I worked on the Tomb Raider franchise, uh, Far Cry franchise. When I first started out, there was no way to learn how to write for games. It was really sort of the Wild West. It was a lot like being a screenwriter in the 30s, where you had this newfangled thing like, oh, movies, but nobody really understood it. No one really knew how to tell stories with it. I had to learn everything the hard way, which means screwing up and, and mostly screwing up in public. <laughs> like I could certainly point to my portfolio and tell you like, oh, I'm really, that was a mess. And that was a mess. But yeah, I learned and it was great, you know. And so I thought, gosh, like, why should other writers have to go through this hard process? Why, why not go through a class? Why can't I just make it easy for them? That's really exciting. I mean, congratulations on, it's been a long journey. I've had some visibility into some of the steps along the way. You've really come very far and accomplished a lot. So you should be very proud. You went out into the world, into your own industry, into your own niche, and created a course. And as is often the case, we found all these interesting innovations that you have come up with. Um, and one in particular that I'd love to dig in with, um, with our conversation today is this model that you've created of a digital campfire. First of all, just 30,000 feet, what is that? And where did it come from? So the phrase itself doesn't come from me. A colleague shared a Harvard Business Review article about how people in their 20s and 30s are looking for an online experience that isn't like being just one of millions, but they kind of want to be in smaller curated spaces and they called it digital campfires. And like examples would be like Roblox um, or Discord um, or TikTok, places where it's not that a bazillion people are there, or even if there are a lot of people there, they're in smaller groups where it feels more human scaled, right? You really feel like you're part of a community, you feel connected. And I thought, gosh, that is what has been happening in my class. And it's not something, I, I'll be honest, it's not something I expected and I didn't plan for it. I spent a lot of time planning my course about the materials and how am I going to teach it. But the community aspect of my class really caught me by surprise. And it just blew up. I mean, and I've been thinking about why did this work? So first of all, what did it look like? So one of the ways it looked like is me setting up a Slack channel, which proceeded to completely blow up. <laughs> like from day one, like these students were just dying to get together and talk about games. And they did not wait until our weekly class to do it. They were all over Slack sharing links and videos and have you played this? And oh my God, I love that. And people just loved spending time together. And then when we had class, you know, I quickly learned that discussions were essential to this and breakout discussions were essential because they just wanted to spend time together. And they're also very tech savvy. This is, you know, my audience is writers, professional writers who love games, which means by definition, they play games. And also just the age range, we're talking about 20s and 30s. So, you know, digital natives, gaming natives. So technology is not a barrier to entry. If anything, it's a, it's a place to find your people. 
Very cool. So let's talk about um, the logistics of how this came together. What was the tech stack underlying all of this? I love the phrase tech stack. It suggests that there was some organizational principles behind this. I would call it more of a tech jumble, initially. <laughs> it was a lot of trying things, partly coming from me and partly suggestions from students. So just to sort of run through the menu, I set up a Slack channel, which I will be honest, for people who are listening that have uh, audiences that are kind of in my age range, I would suggest using Discord. Because a lot of students have told me like Slack is great, but it really reads as work time. And Discord is much more of a sort of, again, it's more of a campfire feel. And they're there all the time anyway. Like they go on Slack for a purpose. Like I've got to go check and see what's going on. But they keep Discord going on all the time in the background to stay in touch with their friends. So that's a big part of it. Of course, Zoom, you know, God bless Zoom. I also used a technology called VoiceThread. I don't know if you're familiar with that. I'm not. So it's a, I think their tagline is how to have interesting conversations around media. And so the idea is that you can upload an intro to a video game and then I can record. I have options of either adding it through like chat bubbles or I can just do a voiceover and I can sort of narrate what's going on and point to things that I want the students to see and appreciate. And also the students themselves can add comments whether it's audio or it's video or it's text, but it creates a way to have an asynchronous conversation looking at a game, which is where a lot of the learning really happened for a lot of people. Were there other keys as well? Like what else do you think made your digital campfire experience take off? Whereas in some courses that we see, there are attempts to get a community going and you know it never really clicks. You see a Slack that is not very active, just, you know, a question here and there, or, you know, a discussion forum that's full of tumbleweeds. (laughs) What was, what was special about your digital campfire experience that, that got it rolling in addition to, you know, people having this kind of strong common interest? It's a great question. First of all, I knew all, I had taken the time to meet all the students individually. And then probably more importantly, they knew me, right? Like all teachers, I set the tone And I am one of them. (laughs) I'm a sensitive creative. And so I naturally place a high priority on creating a, a space where everyone feels comfortable, you know, and generative and collaborative. And then I think I also made an effort of trying to connect people that I thought would would hit it off, right? Like created a buddy system. I waited a couple of weeks until we'd had a chance to know each other, but I I would partner people up so that they could have a go-to person to discuss that week's homework assignment. Um, And then I changed up the buddies uh, duos every week. And so I think there was this real sense, and I heard this over and over again, of just how people felt like, oh my God, my people, here you are, I found you. (laughs) You know, I created a wins channel on Slack because a lot of my students have gone on to get jobs in the industry, like they're either their first job or they finally transitioned into the writing department. You know, they want to celebrate their wins with each other. They, they feel like their wins have happened because of the group. And that's, that's really amazing to see. What would you say to someone who says like, you know, but I, I want to scale, right? I don't want to turn down the person who found the sales page and signed up. In fact, I want, you know, hundreds or thousands of people finding the sales page and signing up without talking to me. Do you think that like you can have a digital campfire or a community experience at that scale? Or does it have to be a kind of small, more, you know, personalized experience where you're vetting, you know, every student and and sort of, you know, curating a cohort of people who are going to be a good fit for each other? I have to say, I think there's a cap to this. I think scaling is possible. Also, by the way, you know, bringing in TAs, for example, like my past students might come in. I might hire them, you know, to be kind of TA for like a section of the class. And so that becomes kind of a teacher proxy, you know, so we create little groups of campfires possibly, but this is all something I'm exploring right now. And, and I do think that there's a, there's a cap, I think, but what, how big that, or how high up until you hit that, that cap, that's kind of TBD. I guess let's talk about that um, TA strategy, because that's important, I think, and very relevant for people. So how did you come up with the, the TA idea? How did you um, implement that? And what were kind of the, the benefits and challenges of working with a TA? 
Well, to be honest, it was just, it was serendipity, truly. I mean, in retrospect, I can't believe I didn't intentionally make this happen. I teach a class at the University of Texas at Austin. So I have graduates who have gone through that course. And one of them, well, a few of them have stayed in touch with me. And one in particular, Jack, he just reached out to me and he just said, hey, you know, here's what I've been doing since college and blah, blah, blah. And I realized that he had a lot of the skills. So it just started off very organically, like, hey, I'd love you to audit my class and maybe you could help with, you know, a little bit here and there. And then as the, as the pilot evolved, his responsibilities grew. He became a tremendous second voice on the Slack channel when I was not around. Teaching ain't easy, y'all. Like he would help me think through what I was going to teach and kind of give me a second set of eyes. And then he, he could give me a reality check because he was in the class, right? He's like, okay, from the student's perspective, here's what I think really worked. And having that extremely tight feedback loop every week just made the class better with every week that passed. I can't do it without him. So, you know, it takes a village and he's a big part of that village. Susan, I, I want to ask about kind of business model viability. I mean, we're talking about a lot of individual attention and screening and having a TA. Can you share, like, what are you charging for this course? Just so people have a sense of like, do the margins work and all that? So this could evolve, but this is the current plan. So, you know, my full course, I'm going to cap it at 40 students and the price is um, $9.99. And I'm planning to launch at least twice a year, possibly three times. So, you know, that's, that's 120000 a year, which is, you know, not bad. <laughs> and actually, I have two levels of courses, right? Class one is sort of designed to kickstart people's game writing career. It opens the door, right? It gets them in the door into the studio. And then the second class is designed to help them really thrive in that role. Like, okay, you've got the job, now what? But, um, you know, this isn't a class that I think lends itself to like thousands of people and it just runs on automatic. I'm not at that place where I want to do that. There may come a time when I, I do want to sort of make it less of a campfire and more of just a, a plug and play. But right now, truly, guys, the community feels like the heart of the campfires is where the magic's happening. One of the things we you know emphasize a lot is the importance of outcome focused course design. So mm-hmm. you know your course helps people get to results that are meaningful for them in the context of, of what they're trying to achieve in their life and their work, as opposed to just providing information basically. And it, it sounds like one of the things that was interesting here is that your community was able to actually help people with their ultimate outcome, uh, which uh, in this case was uh, getting gigs, right? Like getting mm-hmm. opportunities to write professionally in the industry. So you mentioned that before. I'd like to hear a little bit more about that. How did that come about? What was special about the community in terms of helping people find opportunities? And, and you know, what was the, the impact there on, on your students? I'll share tangible outcomes. I'll share kind of intangible. And then I'll talk about the process, like how it happened. So Tangible for sure is like having a portfolio, right? This class had homework and it had deadlines and it had accountability buddies. So people did the work and through doing the work, they developed portfolio pieces, right? And the confidence, like A, I have a portfolio piece. B, I feel good about it because other people have looked at it and said it's good. And, you know, and then we're able to get writing positions. I have one writer who used to be, used to write for The Onion, So he's more of a comedy writer and he is writing for his first game uh, for actually a studio in Belgium. They contacted me saying, hey, do you know anybody who's a good comedy writer? And I was like, well, as a matter of fact, I do. And now he's got that job. And then the more personal things were definitely confidence was a big one for a lot of people. Like, yes, I can do this. Yes, I'm good enough. Gosh, darn it. People grew in their skills. They um, helped each other grow. So that brings us to how this happened. And this is a testimony to them completely. So we had a jobs channel in our Slack and people shared job listings and helped each other think through how to apply. Nobody felt like they were competing with anybody else for jobs because they recognized, and I I pointed it out to them and they saw it in each other, that everyone had kind of a unique thing to offer, right? And even when they both or multiple people applied for the same job, they were genuinely happy if one of them got it. There wasn't the sense of competition or of scarcity. 
they they really went to bat for each other. And I was able to help too. Very cool. Yeah, Susan, I can imagine someone listening to this and thinking, this sounds super complicated. I mean, you've got your curriculum, you've got your TAs, you've got your teaching, you've got your discussions, you've got the campfires, which sounds really complicated from a tech standpoint and the culture and you're screening people. What would you say to someone who's like staring down the barrel of all this complexity and just feeling a little bit overwhelmed? Well, Danny, as you know, I'm the queen of overwhelm. (laughs) Nobody knows how to get overwhelmed like me. I do. So I would say get somebody on your side to walk you through this step by step. And it does sound overwhelming when you say it, but honestly, it's been a lot of work. I'm not going to lie, like a lot of work, but it never felt like overwhelming work. It just felt like hard work that was finite, right? Like the pilot was hard work, but now I've learned so much and now I'm ready to kind of replicate it. And replicating something's very different from starting from scratch, even if I'm improving, right? It's a revision. It's not a first draft. So I think it is not something people should try on their own. That's for sure. But if you get the right person in your corner, you know, there's no telling what you can do. Susan O'Connor is a working game writer who teaches aspiring game writers how to break into the industry. You can find out more about her classes at SusanO'ConnorWriter.com. That's Susan, O-C-O-N-N-O-R, writer.com. All right, Abe, so now my favorite part of the show, we get to just debrief and chat a little bit, kind of like we frankly do offline all the time when we're talking about courses, except now there is a microphone. What jumped out to you as interesting or noteworthy about what Susan shared with us? Wow, okay, there was a lot to unpack here because there's so much going on um, in Susan's course. I'd say at the high level, the big things for me is that this is, again, we, we talk a lot about the importance of designing for outcomes, designing for results, helping your students get results. This is the drum that we're constantly beating. But it's not always easy to show like really clear examples of how that works and how powerful real world results can be from a course. So in Susie's example of being able to like actually help people get jobs and contracts and advance their career, it's almost like the pinnacle, you know, of, of results you can achieve for any kind of career or industry oriented course. So it, in terms of beginning with the end in mind, you know, to me, that, that's very inspiring. Um, and then it was also really interesting, the methods she used to achieve that outcome. What do you think of that? I mean, community and, and cohort based learning experiences, this, this is your jam. Yeah. So th- like communities become this total buzzword, right? Um, everyone is is talking about online community, building a community around your brand. And it, it's great that it's getting this attention. But the problem is actually creating a cohesive online community around the course is not at all easy. And so you see many, many courses that just have a discussion forum or have a Facebook group tacked on. And there's not really a sense of community. At at best, there's just kind of sporadic questions. And so what Susan's kind of example points to, I think, is what does it look like to build, you know, authentic and and more meaningful community for people in the context of an online course? And her example shows that it is um, achievable. The bad news is that it does take a lot of work. It also takes having a focus for your course where your students have a very strong common bond, which I think is actually a very important takeaway because if you want to create a learning community around your course, it's not going to be effective to have a very broad mandate or, you know, scope for who you're trying to attract into the course. One of the reasons Susan was able to have such a cohesive community is she specifically attracted people who want to write for video games in a professional context. That is a extremely well-defined kind of customer profile or avatar for her course. And these people had, as, as she talked about, just so much in common, right? They had a lot in common demographically, but 
they just lived this culture of gaming together. And so that instantly created a comfortable sort of baseline to jumpstart the community. Whereas if you're bringing in people with, you know, very different um, demographics, experiences, context, and goals into a course, it's going to take much more effort to get that to channel. It really gets back to the idea of do things that don't scale, right? She didn't try to build a course that was immediately going to be, you know, hundreds of people just going through a bunch of videos on their own. She was very intentional about doing this with smaller groups where she was vetting each person, making sure they were a good fit for the community and communicating with them one-on-one, not just throwing them into a Slack channel. So these are, you know, I think really important strategies for anyone who wants to build a meaningful community is make sure that you have a clear focus. So you're bringing people with a you know, common interest who are going to be able to bond and support each other. And then making sure that you've mapped out your role as a facilitator to really guide people into the community and nurture it from nothing into something that is meaningful and self-sustaining. Yeah, I really like the awareness that, I mean, yes, there was a good tech stack selected. You know, she was working with Zoom and she had Slack and she was looking at Discord. And it's good to have that, but she really had a keen understanding that the real driver isn't the technology. It's the care and attention and curation that goes into the culture. We've seen working with a lot of online course creators that when you start with really a carefully curated and well-tended to culture, you learn how to scale it. So it's very hard when you're kind of, you know, looking at your first enrollment of a dozen people and then looking ahead to 40, it's like, how does that get to 400? You know, you don't have your your first five students yet and you're already thinking about, what can I build that will work with 500? Yeah, you have to get those learnings at each step in the process for sure. Something I also really appreciated is really Susan approached this with a very, very adaptable open, go with the flow kind of attitude in terms of let's see what emerges, let's see what people need. And then, you know, okay, that's what people need. That's what's emerging as as valuable and resonant. Let's really lean into that. There's a certain amount of of adaptability and kind of thinking on your feet, I think that is very important in developing and cultivating a, a successful course that Susan has really exemplified here. Yeah, I think that that's partly where um, people get stuck in a way, is feeling that Everything has to be planned out in advance and planned out in a way that will scale, right? So like something, again, we talk about a lot is kind of the wrong way to go about designing your course is thinking about, okay, I'm going to create a course that a thousand people are going to be able to take, you know, completely independently on their own. I'm not going to be talking with them at all. And I'm also going to plan out and, you know, create every detail of that kind of perfect self-study course experience completely in advance. And that just leads you completely down the wrong path because you're not getting those insights um, from working with small, very personally with small groups of students that then lead to these opportunities for innovation, right? It was by working with small groups of students that Susan discovered the idea of having a buddy system. It's how she discovered the idea of uh, bringing in a TA that turned out to be you know transformational for how uh, she created the course, you know, week to week and, and made the content really relevant for students. Um, it's how, you know, she discovered how impactful the community could be for helping people get projects and get jobs um, coming out of the course. Like all these learnings would never have happened if she had tried to like script out and create this perfect, like quote unquote passive, you know, video course completely in advance. It's also interesting that Actually, most of the ingredients for scalability are already there, right? Once you have a, a TA structure and a ratio of students to TA, you know, you can have as many students as you want as long as you get the right corresponding number of TA. Same thing like a buddy system scales for as many students as you want as long as they're, you know, an even number of them. Um, even the campfires would probably work very successfully with some kind of a cell division into pods as, as it grows to a larger scale. So, but again, you know, you can't pre-plan that. You really have to see how it grows and what emerges in order to, to kind of see how it plays out. And that, again, that, that speaks to really the mindset you need to create successful courses. You can't wait until it's all figured out and then go because then you, you never move. It sounds like that didn't necessarily come to her naturally as well either, right? That that was, you know, a learning curve and initially very uncomfortable for Susan that 
that was how she had to facilitate the course for it to be successful. So for anyone listening who, if that feels very unnatural, right, that you're going into it in this more exploratory and iterative fashion, like know that Susan, even though she had these incredible successes, that was initially uncomfortable for her as well. Do you want to read us out? This episode of Course Lab was produced by Cynthia Lamb with support from Missy Lance and Jeff Coverton. Danny Eady is our executive producer. Big, big thanks to Susan O'Connor for taking the time to share her successes and challenges regarding her course. Again, you can find out more about her classes at SusanO'ConnorWriter.com. That's SusanO'ConnorWriter.com. And if you yearn to say, I made it, you'll definitely want to tune into Mercy's new podcast, Making It. In each episode, a successful entrepreneur will share what making it means to them and what they've learned along the way. You certainly don't want to miss what is to come this season on Course Lab. So please subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening right now. And if you like the show, please leave us a review. It's the best way to help us get these ideas out to more people. Yeah, again, I'm a Crystal co-founder and CEO of Rizuku here with Danny Eni, CEO of Mercy. And you've been listening to Course Lab. So can I listen in while you and Abe chat or should I just wait for the podcast to come out? You've got to wait for the podcast to come out. Okay.